Hey everyone, I'm Kenji, product manager in Chrome, and I lead our AI ML efforts on the web platform. Hi, I'm Maud, developer relation engineer in Chrome. Now, I know you are probably up to your eyeballs in mind blowing AI demos. Either the sky seems to be the limit, or there is hydrogen in the AI rocket fuel. Self driving cars that double as therapies, maybe someday. But today, let's cut to the birds. Instead, let's talk about practical AI, the kind that may even run on your devices. And to be clear, we're not talking about yet another chatbot. We won't solve existential questions like what makes the perfect bag perfect, although maybe. We are talking about practical solutions to help your users and boost your business. In fact, let's make it a game. See if we can save practical more times than AI. Ready? Let's dive in. Before we dive in, just a note, no ML expertise is required for you to follow this talk. And you'll find all the links we mentioned in the video description below. Now, AI can amaze in demos, but there are also successful real-world practical applications. For example, nearly half of you are using AI tools in their development workflow. Now, what about user-facing features? Well, we went straight to the source, web developers like you, to uncover your biggest pain points for building user-facing AI features. And here is what you told us. First, we're in the early days. Teams are exploring how to augment their product with AI in ways that are business posting. Second, especially with large language models, LLMs for short, developers worry about controlling non-deterministic outputs. And finally, for now, most of you prefer pre-trained models and ready-made APIs because your focus is building product features. So for now, you'd rather leave training and fine tuning to ML specialists. I can totally relate with the desire to build valuable feature without having to be an AI expert. A feature's value isn't defined by the fancy tech behind it. So let's hit pause on the high and focus on what really makes a difference. Right, Maud? Exactly. We'll show you how to augment existing features in your web application with a touch of AI. We won't get into training or fine tuning. Instead, we'll really focus on ready to use solutions. And we'll also share engineering challenges we encountered on the way. OK, let's show some practical demos. Whoa, not so fast. What about all the pain points you mentioned earlier? We got to take a step back and before the demos and talk about the why. So let's see why on device AI ML can be a superpower and how it fits with server side AI options. Now, we know on server AI is a workhorse. It's familiar, it's readable, and it does a fantastic job. So we're not here to say, ditch the server. Instead, think of on-device AI as a powerful new tool in your toolbox, one that can unlock some amazing possibilities alongside any existing server-side setup. On-device AI lets you handle data locally. This can greatly simplify your privacy story. If you have users with sensitive data, for instance, you can still delight them with AI features while also giving them an end-to-end -end encrypted mode. For some use case, ditching the round trip to the server means near instant results. And so on-device AI can be the difference between a viable feature and a janky user experience. On-device AI can help you manage your server cost. Your user's device can shoulder some of the processing load in exchange for more access to AI features. You may even consider a free tier with on-device AI features to help your customers get a glimpse of what they would get with a premium plan. One last thing before we jump into the demos, practical tips about on-device AI. First, not every device is going to be an AI powerhouse. And so design your feature with graceful fallbacks when the device can't handle the advanced stuff. Also, run benchmark on your target devices. Second, on device AI works best in a focus mode. So with the right script, even the smallest model can deliver a step stealing performance within the user journey. Also, you can always fix it in post. In fact, both pre and post processing. This can help simplify the step at hand. AI models can be hefty. So be smart or transparent about downloads, especially on mobile so that you don't blow up your user's data plans. In addition, hosting these models can be demanding, 
So be sure to have a good serving and caching strategy. All right, with this background, let's start with the practical AIification of an hypothetical website, Mod and Kenji's practical bags shopping site. So I'm a product manager, Mod is an engineer, and we both work in tech, which means that we have a backpack obsession because we don't just carry gear. No, no, no. We carry our work lives. And so every pocket, every strap has to deliver. For us, choosing a backpack is like designing a website. It needs the perfect balance of functionality, aesthetics, and a grid of pockets for all our gadgets. Basically, the stitch perfect UX for our life. And so we built a website for folks like us, hoping to crowdsource the perfectly practical bag. And judging by the volume of product reviews, it seems like there are dozens of us. And we are all incredibly opinionated about zippers. Sadly, all these reviews make it harder to debug the good, the bad, and the, um, can it practically fit my absolutely large laptop bits? And so many folks just give up and end up with another sad free conference tote bag. I wish we could summarize all these reviews into a TLDR with the pros and the cons. I think this would work best on the server side. That way we can do it once for everyone. We can also summarize our existing reviews and store the results. And then when new reviews cross a threshold, we can refresh the summary to capture the latest insight. So Maud, can you walk us through the technical details? Sure. To create summaries asynchronously, we can use a job queue, but let's focus on the GNAI part. What we want is something like this. A summary of all reviews, along with a short list of most common pros and cons of the product. So to build this feature, we can use an LLM API like the OpenAI API or Google's Gemini API. Gemini is Google's largest and most capable AI model. And here we'll access the Gemini API with the Google AI JavaScript SDK for Node.js applications. But SDKs are also available for other languages like Python or Go, and there's also a REST API. So here's how to build our feature. First, I create a key for the Gemini API. The API offers a free tier and a paid tier for higher volume. And I define my key in my environment file. Remember to treat your API keys as secrets. Then I npm install the Google AIJS SDK. I require it in my Node application, and I'm ready to use it. So I first instantiate a GenAI object, and I get a model here, Gemini Pro. Here, I could also tweak the model safety settings or pick a different model if I needed vision features, for example. Then I call generate content on that model, passing my prompt as an argument. And don't worry, we'll dive into the prompt in a minute. And this is here an example output, a summary of all reviews alongside a list of common pros and cons. This summary is LLM generated, so run this through checks before displaying it to your users and also allow your users to share some feedback in case something is off. Now, let's take a closer look at my prompt. I'm being specific about the output format, and I'm also providing an example. This technique is called one-shot prompting, and this will help me get consistent summaries. And by the way, for designing your prompts, check out Google AI Studio. It's a great web-based tool for fast prompt engineering and iteration. Now, one heads up, many reviews can hit the token limit. Remember, a token isn't always a single word. It can be parts of a word or multiple words together. And Gemini Pro's 30,000 token limit means that my prompt can include at most 600 average 30 word reviews in English, minus the rest of my prompt instructions. So I could take, for example, the 600 most recent reviews and use the count tokens method to double check. And by the way, I wouldn't need to handle this if I was using a model like Gemini 1.5, which has a 1 million token limit. One privacy tip, I'm stripping usernames from my reviews there's no need to risk personal info, which doesn't help summarize the reviews anyway. So that was the Gemini API. But if you're on Google Cloud or need enterprise-grade support, check out Vertex AI. You'll get Gemini Pro and more like Anthropic's cloud models. In the cloud console, what I really like is the model garden view because it's a great way to explore and match models to your specific use case. Okay, Kenji, what should we look into next? Let's stay with the product reviews for a moment. 
the summarization feature will help, but the quality of the reviews matters too. And sure, we are already running checks on the service side to eliminate toxic reviews. Um, in, in fact, let's have a look at some of the recent examples that got filtered out. Hmm, that's a bit of a mixed bag. These reviews are toxic, but a few actually contain useful observations. This is unfortunate because according to external data, 82% of online shoppers actively sync negative reviews before making a purchase. And these can also help reduce return rates. So could we gently nudge users away from writing reviews like, this bag sucks, and toward, you know, actual details about sticky zippers? It will result in more high quality reviews and save everyone time. Mod, here are some ideas to explore. Let's check the review before it gets submitted. So for example, this backpack is bad because something is totally fine, but we don't want reviews with swear words. Also, let's help our customer focus on writing a helpful review by maybe suggesting the associated rating. And how about checking if a review is negative or positive? Although that might be a bit redundant with the star rating. That said, I would like us to explore different approaches. Finally, some user experience consideration. Ultimately, users should decide. And so let's give them the choice to modify the suggested rating. Let's also clearly explain to our users that the suggestions are auto-generated. On the technical front, we could do it all server side. But from a cost and latency angle, I think it makes more sense to try on device. After all, we want to speed up the process for the user. And so it would be great to auto-generate all of these as soon as the user stops typing. Sure, and I like your approach. We take features we have today in our product and we just augment them with a touch of AI. So I built a little prototype. Let me show you. When the user stops typing a review, we automatically suggest a rating and a sentiment. And in case the review is toxic, we display a hint nudging the user to rephrase the review in a more constructive way. All of this runs on device in the browser. There's no server round trips, no API key. And here, for the sake of the demo, I'm using a mix of techniques to show you what's in your toolbox for on-device AI. For toxicity analysis, I'm using TensorFlow.js, which is a widely used open source ML library for inference and training on the web. For sentiment analysis, I'm using Transformers.js, which is a web AI library from Hugging Face. It supports inference only for models that have been converted specifically. And Transformers.js gives you a developer-friendly use case focused API. For star ratings, I'm using Gemma2B. It's the smallest version of Google's open weight model Gemma, and I'm running it with MediaPipe's experimental LLM inference API. This API opens the door to running massive language models fully on device across platforms and with state-of-the-art latency. And that's a big deal because LLMs have memory and compute demands which are over a hundred times larger than classic on-device models. Okay, let's take a look at some code. Um, here's my code for toxicity. I import the library, I load the model, and I run my classification function asynchronously. And then I check if for any of the toxicity categories displayed here, the prediction is above my threshold, which I set to 0 0.9. Now let's look at my sentiment analysis code with Transformers.js. I import the library and I do a one-line setup for the whole sentiment analysis process. This is called a pipeline. And with this, I don't need to wrestle manually with raw model loading. When I use the pipeline for the first time, the model gets downloaded and then cached. But after that, it's much faster. I then await my classifier and I pass it the text to analyze. And I get the sentiment label outputted by the model. My code only uses a sentiment label if it's sure, over 90% confidence. Now, let's bring on store ratings. So I downloaded Gemma2B from Kaggle. In case you're curious, the IT here in the model name stands for Instruction Tuned, which means that I can interact with the model by giving it instructions, as you would with Gemini or ChatGPT. And here's a quick look at my code. I import the MediaPipe library, I npm installed. 
Then I do my file setup, which means I point the code to the right model files. And this is important here because GenAI models may have a specific directory structure for their assets. I then load the model, which basically means that I get the LLM interface ready. And finally, I fit it my prompt, more on my prompt later, and I get the text outputs. And then I'm ready to parse this for the actual store rating. I extract the store rating from the, from the response as a number. Okay, cool. So our little prototype works. But what have we learned and what do we observe? So observation number one, none of the code I wrote requires ML expertise. And sure, I did spend some time crafting my prompt, but the rest of the code is really standard web development stuff. So on device AI can fit right into your existing skill set. Observation number two, whoa, this is fast. Gemma rating and transform SGS sentiment analysis beat server round trips for speed. So what's great is we get instant feedback as the user stops typing. I'm using an 800 milliseconds timeout here. TensorFlow.js toxicity is a little bit slower, so that model needs optimization love. So to boost it, I've turned on WebGPU. Remember Kenji's tip? Make sure to run benchmarks on your target device because inference speed can vary a lot. What's awesome is that we expect on-device inference to keep getting faster with WebGPU, WebAssembly, and library updates. Great news, for example, Transformers.js added WebGPU support in their version 3, which is a huge win for real-time on-device AI. Observation number three, I said this was fast, right? But wait a minute. Inference is fast, but what about loading? That's the challenge. Our toxicity model is a few kilobytes plus the TensorFlow.js library, which is a few kilobytes, manageable. But Transformers.js sentiment model is 60 megabytes. Gemma, 1.3 gigabytes. I know this will take serious download time and impact user experience. Hosting and serving these models will also have a cost. So it's time for a reality check. These models dwarf the median web page size, which is 2 megabytes. So is on-device AI realistic? Well, it depends. First, as Kenji explained, the business value is key. Is my one gigabyte download justified for basic store rating? Probably not. But it may be a great solution for privacy-sensitive features, enhancing your free tier without server-side costs, or long-living use cases like browser extensions where the model is downloaded just once until the next update. Also, there are mitigation strategies for performance. Remember Kenji's tips, use caching, provide clear loading indicators, download smartly, don't block the whole experience on model loading. Try and design on-device Gen AI features as enhancements, not core requirements. Finally, and that's the most exciting bit, Gen AI is a nascent field. So we expect smaller web-optimized models to emerge over time. Observation number four, well, that's pretty accurate. Both the sentiment and the toxicity analysis are really accurate. Now, what about my on-device star ratings with Gemma? Well, to assess accuracy here, I use the Gemini model server-side ratings as a reference. So for this prototype, I was really only checking manually with a few reference reviews. For a real application, you need a proper accuracy testing system. So you see my Gemma ratings mostly match the Gemini model's ratings, but this took work. For example, initially Gemma was shy at outputting extreme reviews, so one star or five star reviews, and that's likely because these are less frequent than mid-range reviews. So it took quite some prompt tweaking to fix that. While Gemini on server nails it with a basic prompt like this one, while Gemma on device needs more hand-holding. And that's expected because it's a much smaller model, so it's less capable. Here's my final prompt for Gemma. I'm using a few techniques here. First one, chain of thought. Make the model think first. Have it analyze the review and then give the rating. And for me, asking for the reasoning before the rating improves Gemma's accuracy. Second technique, few short prompts. Use examples. But watch out, don't test with the same examples you used in the prompt because that will inflate the results. So here's a key takeaway for us. Don't expect small, off-the-shelf, on-device Gen AI models to do exactly what you can do on a chat UI like Gemini or ChatGPT, because these are very powerful, huge LLMs running on servers. 
So remember Kenji's tip, understand your use case to decide whether on-device AI may be a fit. Let's talk a little bit about use cases. Off-the-shelf models that are specialized in a classification task like toxicity or sentiment analysis, these work great. We've seen this with the Transformers.js LLM model and even with the tiny TensorFlow.js model, which is not an LLM, it's not a GenAI model, that's just a classic NLP model. For custom classification like our store rating task, Gemma2b did a good job with the right prompt because it's a versatile LLM. But for a more complex custom classification task, for example, assigning multiple tags to a review, well, then it may require some fine tuning. And Gemma's open weight architecture allows for fine tuning. But for more generic Gen AI tasks like summarization, well, Gemma2b on device can do a great job out of the box. Whoa, nice bag of tricks. I wasn't expecting that an LLM would run on a laptop without a fancy GPU card. That said, I think there are a few glitches. For one, it's not practical to have every site download their own LLM. Also, you mentioned that you had to do prompt engineering. That's really unfortunate, given that most developers would prefer to focus on building features, not spending time finding the right incantation. But the use case are totally of interest. For instance, CyberAgent, a leading internet company in Japan, is one of the partners who has shared their excitement. They would like to use on-device AI to help creators with suggestions for the final steps before hitting the publish button. This could be suggestion for a title with different styles, like in this prototype, or an abstract for the article. It's also important for CyberAgent that this is done on device, because the content isn't yet published, and so it shouldn't be sent to another server. So it's time for another PM move, learn what if step. What if the model was already there for any site to use? That way, you wouldn't have to download your own LLM. What if you could get the model to do what you need, like summarization, without having to master prompt engineering skills? Here's how this could look like. Your browser could have a foundation model and some smaller expert models or fine tunings of the bigger model. There could be a prompt API, mostly for exploring the potential of the on-device LLM, and APIs for specific use case, using the LLM with fine tunings or the expert models. In fact, we felt so compelled by this opportunity that we've been working on a proof of concept with Gemini Nano in Chrome, a prompt API, and some purpose-built API. Oh, the cyber agent demo you saw earlier, it was using this experimental build. So while we made a lot of progress, it's still very early days. And so we love to hear from the community, feedback on the approach, key use case you would like us to consider, and much more. More about this at the end of the talk. For now, let's not get carried away by this whole new bag of opportunities. Instead, let's see if we can find one last pocket of pain that we could improve. OK, so perhaps a bit of a stretch, but I was wondering if AI could help our site be more successful abroad. The top feedback we get from international customers has to do with after sales support. And by unpacking the issue, we quickly find out that the root cause appears to be language barriers, since we only have English-speaking support agents. It would be so much nicer if we could help our customers and agents communicate in their preferred language without any need for external translation tools. And sure, some users try to overcome the language barrier with their browser's built-in page translation feature or third-party translation tools. But user experience is subpar with interactive feature, especially like our after-sales support chat. And so for a chat with integrated translation, I think it's best to minimize any delays. So we should definitely process the information on the device. It will also allow us to translate in real time, even before the user decides to submit their message, without having to send anything to a server. On the user experience side, I believe that transparency is crucial when we try to bridge language gaps with automated means. So before the conversation starts, let's make sure that everyone understands that they are using this awesome tech. This will set expectation and help avoid awkward moments if the translation isn't perfect. Plus, this will likely guide folks away from complex idioms 
which might leave the AI scrambling for meaning. Sadly, I couldn't find a small enough model that would work for our use case. And this is very really unfortunate because we've heard interest in Translate use case from many partners. For instance, the insurance broker Policy Bazaar would love to do exactly what we are talking about. Their primary market is India, which officially recognizes 22 languages. So translation will help customers and support agents communicate more easily. And our device will help provide a real-time user experience while minimizing the costs associated with frequent API calls. So let me wear my Chrome PM hat for a moment. Sensing an opportunity for a purpose-built API, we started working on an experimental translate API with an expert model built into Chrome. And as it happens, I have another proof of concept build. So Maud, can you zip us through it? Sure, time for another demo. Here we have it, a customer super chat where I can type in my native language and get real-time translation. The support agent replies in English and I see it translated back on the fly. This prototype here is possible thanks to a translation model that's built right into Chrome. So let's peek under the hood here. Chrome exposes a neat API with a window.model object. Two key methods here. Can translate. This one checks if a translation model for your language pair is ready. It returns readily if the model is already available on device. After download, if the browser first needs to download the model. And no, if translation is not possible. Second method is create translator. And this sets up your translator object asynchronously. In case the model needs downloading first, it will wait until it's ready. And then the translator object itself has a single powerful method called translate. You feed it the source text and it outputs the translated version. Now remember, this is experimental and Chrome specific for now. So wrap all your code in feature detection. So you see the model might need time to be available to the user and you have two approaches to handle this. One is you could only enable your translation powered UI elements once the model is good to go. And second is you could start with cloud-based translation and then seamlessly switch to the on-device model once it's downloaded. As Mo demonstrated, there are lots of practical use cases for AI. And recent innovation will unlock even more opportunities. We've provided practical advice about when to choose on device or server side, as well as how to combine on device and server side for graceful fallback and progressive enhancement. We are eager to see what you create with these ideas. Use hashtag WebAI to share your discoveries and challenges. This feedback will help us make AI a powerful yet practical tool for everyone. Talking about challenges, we did hit a few rough patches in our journey. Yes, and we shared a few work in progress ideas that we we'll like feedback on. Speaking of which, if you are interested, please engage with us on this journey. Feedback about your approach, key use case that interests you the most, as well as signing up to receive key updates for our progress. In addition, please consider signing up to our early preview program to eventually test drive these early ideas through local prototyping. Before we leave, um, did we manage to say practical more fun than the other world? What other words? Do you mean AI? Uh, please don't say the word. AI? AI? Practical, AI, practical, AI, practical, AI, practical. AI, AI.